I want to share with you one of the most difficult and complicated surgeries I think I've ever been a part of, and it was just performed actually three days ago. And what makes the surgery so difficult and complicated is not just actually the surgical maneuvers, but it is the logic that goes behind the treatment. The backstory is that this is an eye with intractable, malignant glaucoma from aqueous misdirection. You'll notice this eye has got an oversized penetrating graft, and you'll notice that there is this necrotic, mottled appearing iris, which actually is just behind the corneal endothelium. In fact, the anterior chamber is only a slit. It is almost non-existent. And this anterior chamber is almost non-existent because this eye has had so much surgery and so much inflammation between the penetrating keratoplasty and then actually multiple subsequent glaucoma surgeries, including a diode laser, a trabeculectomy, a trab revision, the eye has been inflamed and is scarred and the anterior chamber has shallowed and narrowed. Despite multiple prior surgical iridectomies, this aqueous misdirection and malignant glaucoma has been intractable. And in this situation, this eye being operated has a pressure of 40, a failing cornea, and the nerve is dying. So the question is, what can be done for this eye? How do you treat this horrific glaucoma? What do you do to reform the anterior chamber to protect the cornea? Well, in situations like this, we have a technique which we have employed a few times now which seems to be more effective than anything else that I know. And that technique is to remove the patient's iris and their existing lens, which is currently in the capsular bag. This eye has an iris. It has an IOL in the capsular bag. And yet, those structures are fused together and socked up against the back of the cornea. And we have found that these eyes can be treated by removing the iris and the lens and the capsular bag to render basically an aneuritic unicameral eye and simultaneously placing a scleral fixated lens. And by doing these things, you actually provide room inside the eye for fluid to drain and you remove that tissue which would inevitably scar back up against the back of the cornea. So this surgery that I'm showing you here was just performed two days ago and it is an anterior segment revision to remove the iris, to remove the lens, to perform a vitrectomy and to do a glued IOL. This starts with a pyridomy made nasally and temporally. You'll notice all of the bleeding. This patient is on chronic anticoagulation. Even though he stopped his Coumadin two weeks previously, you'll notice still he has this prodigious tendency towards uh, extravasation. You'll also notice that the conjunctiva is thin and friable and has been fused down to the scleral surface, so it's not easy to perform this pyridomy. And I'm gonna fast forward and scrub ahead in the video to show you the key maneuvers. Now, there are a variety of ways to do a scleral fixated lens. There's the Yamani technique, there are a variety of different suturing methods, but in this particular situation, I think a glued IOL is probably best. The reason that a glued IOL may be best in this situation is by making flaps in the sclera and then sclerostomies you can perform a vitrectomy through those sclerostomies without needing to blindly place ports through the pars plana, which you can't verify. You can't confirm an infusion, for instance. I think it's also nice to start by doing these scleral flaps because by decompressing the eye, then it allows you to go into the anterior chamber and reform the AC. So the very first step here is to make our scleral flaps. This is an Ashvin Agrawal marker used for glued IOLs. It's inked with gentian violet marking pen. It shows where these partial thickness scleral flaps will be placed approximately uh, uh, centered on the cornea 
with the flaps 180 degrees apart. Then you make these partial thickness scleral flaps. I like to score them first with a 15 degree blade and then do my dissection with a crescent knife, okay? So here we are, I'm doing a partial thickness scleral dissection with a crescent knife, holding the eye with a cotton swab, okay? So I've scored the edges of this flap and now I'm just wiggling it aside to make this partial thickness scleral flap. And just nice and easy, gently, you have a nice flap 50% of the way through the sclera. There we go. And you have one on either side of the eye for symmetry purposes. At the base of this flap, about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half from the limbus, you make a sclerostomy. This is with a 26 gauge needle diving straight into the back of the eye. And you'll notice when I puncture into the eye, I get this gush of fluid because the eye has been under pressure because there's aqueous misdirection. Fluid is being produced and it can't get up through this scarified pupil which is encased in an anterior lenticular membrane. Once I've done that, once I've punctured into the eye and decompressed the posterior segment, then it becomes possible actually to reform the anterior chamber. So I'll make a paracentesis and then I'll put a dispersive viscoelastic into the anterior chamber. And then after the anterior chamber is more or less maintained here with a dispersive viscoelastic, I can use a cyclodialysis spatula to try to recreate something of an angle. And you'll notice sweeping across how much resistance I'm encountering with the cyclodialysis spatula. And this is because there's so much fibrotic membrane, anterior synechia, encasing the iris at its root and fused through the iris to the capsular rim. So then once I'm certain that I have a space there in the anterior chamber, I'll make another paracentesis and I'll use that as a vantage point to sweep along and verify that I have a deep angle 360 degrees around, okay? And I'm using not only a cyclodialysis spatula, but you can see here, this is a 30 gauge half inch needle and it's sharp and I can use that to penetrate through this membrane which is overlying the pupillary aperture. You need something sharp because really the whole pupil and iris and into the angle is one continuous sheet of fibrotic membrane this eye has had, if I cannot emphasize enough, many surgeries to try to deepen the chamber, to try to create some conduit for fluid to flow out of the eye. Simply deepening the chamber here with the cyclodialysis spatula and reforming with viscoelastic, that's not going to fix the problem. Stripping this membrane is not going to fix the problem. You have to get this crap out of the eye. You have to remove all of these materials so they don't fuse back up against to the posterior corneal surface. So what I'm doing to try to ensure that doesn't happen is I'm grabbing the iris and I'm putting it under stretch with one hand and the other hand I'm using coaxial curved retina scissors. The bigger, the better. These are 23 gauge and I'm stretching and I'm pulling the iris and I'm cutting at the root and I'm doing this 360 degrees around. And it's easiest to perform this maneuver if you have the anterior chamber which is filled with a dispersive viscoelastic and if you sort of take the iris piece by piece. If you make quadrant actually to cut off one piece and then move along to another quadrant as opposed to trying to strip it out all in one piece. Okay, So we'll do that painstakingly and delicately removing pieces of the iris and this anterior lenticular membrane all the way around. You'll notice that the red reflex is poor in this eye, basically non-existent. And the reason, of course, is that this eye, naturally, you would expect it to be filling with blood. It's bleeding. And even though I'm cutting here and you see blood, Considering the proximity to the ciliary body and the fact that I'm munching iris in a patient who's chronically anticoagulated, there's actually not as much blood as you would think that there could be or would be. And that's because this tissue is necrotic. 
It's got to go. It's not normal. You can't leave this crap in the eye or it will always inevitably sock back up against the back of the patient's cornea. So it's got to go. Now remember, this is a pseudophagic eye. There's a lens in here somewhere. There's a capsular bag in here somewhere and it's not clear where those things are. And I really don't want to drop this lens into the back of the eye. So very carefully, I'm looking as I'm doing this to see where's the lens. Can I find the lens? And if so, can I grab it so I don't lose it, okay? So here I am just sort of taking more bites and snipping out of the iris as far back at the root as I can find. And as I do that, I'm going to encounter, here's the lens. Now, interestingly, this lens, it turns out, is a three-piece lens already. This patient had previously had cataract surgery many years ago by another very talented doctor. And this eye, at the time, had an unoperated cornea. This was an eye with advanced keratoconus, an extremely steep and thinned cornea. And this IOL, which was placed, was for that sort of degree of keratoconus. And since then, it's had a penetrating graft, and now that IOL is grossly the wrong power. So even though it's a three-piece lens and it could conceivably be refixated to the sclera, it's not the right, right power because the corneal power has changed since it was implanted. But still, we can't drop it into the back of the eye. So here I am, I've maneuvered one haptic out through the main incision, which is a 3.0 millimeter clear corneal wound. And I'm trying to maneuver the IOL up from back where it is encased in scar tissue, okay? So I've got it gripped with some coaxial forceps and I'm dialing its distal haptic up into the anterior chamber. Now the question is, by the way, if you can't leave this IOL in the eye, then what do you do with it? How do you get it out? Normally, what you would do is you'd bring an IOL up into an anterior chamber, you'd cut it into multiple pieces with some sort of scissor, and you'd remove each piece from the eye. There are different ways to remove IOLs. In fact, my favorite way these days is there are uninjecting forceps that you can use just to grab the IOL and remove it in one piece without cutting, without twisting from a 2.6 millimeter incision. But I don't have those forceps with me at the time. So how do I get this lens out of the eye without cutting it and dropping it back into the eye? Well, I'm gonna show you the technique that we used. So you'll remember that I made these flaps there in the sclera and these sclerostomies. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach through these scleral flaps and I'm going to externalize the haptic. I'm going to grab each haptic with a coaxial max gripping forceps and I'm going to pull them out through these scleral flaps, out through these sclerostomies. And when I do that, you'll notice that the IOL, so here we go, I've got the first haptic externalized and now I'm externalizing the second haptic here through this flap. And there it is. And the eye well is now sitting extremely stably there in the middle of the eye. And it's not going to drop here. Not only will it not drop while I'm doing the manipulations of cleaning up this residual iris tissue, but also it will stay there so I can cut it in half and remove each half through the wound. And the haptics being incarcerated in the sclera prevents the lens from dropping, okay? So here, I'm just cleaning up some of this iris tissue. I'm just cutting and removing it. There's the IOL sitting there stably in the center of the eye. It's tempting, quite tempting, just to leave it here. But it's 10 or 15 diopters, the wrong power. So we can't just leave it there as tempting as that would be. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab it and I'm going to cut it with these coaxial forceps and I'm going to remove each half from the eye. And that's done very safely and predictably because the haptics which are in the sclera hold the lens and prevent it from dropping. 
once the lens is out of the eye, we have an aphagic eye, which is unicameral, and it's time to inject the new lens, okay? And by the way, this is another reason why the glued IOL is a superior procedure for this patient as opposed to Yamani, because if you were doing a Yamani technique, you could not hold the patient's existing lens in the eye as we did with this glued procedure, okay? The glued procedure was necessary in order to hold the lens stable. This is a CT Lucia, and I'm gonna use that even though I'm doing a glued IOL, not a Yamani technique, because it's such a versatile lens. I chose this lens before I started the case because I wasn't sure what technique for scleral fixation we wanted. This is the one that I selected, and that lens is useful for everything. So I've got one haptic externalized, I'll do the same thing on the other side. And here's our lens, which is now sort of centered there in the eye. And what you'll notice is I'm just going to close the scleral flaps here just by suturing them up, them up with some tinno nylon suture. This is to prevent hypotony postoperatively. And then I will repair the conjunctival peritonies using to seal glue. Now, theoretically, the glued IOL you don't need to suture these scleral flaps. But in this particular case, I am doing that because this conjunctiva is so thin and friable and has had so much trauma from previous operations. And then I'm going to suture these paracentesis and the main wounds that I've made in the cornea once again to make sure that I have no hypotony. So this is the end of the case, okay? After we suture these sclerostomies, and, or excuse, suture the conjunctiva and suture these corneal incisions, we have a deep, hyper deep anterior chamber with a physiologically pressured eye and basically zero chance that the chamber would ever be shallow or that the angle would ever be obstructed in the future. So the reason I show this video, this long video of a long surgery, was because I think that this is an underappreciated way to treat malignant glaucoma with intractable aqueous misdirection. I've seen so many situations in which you have this nasty, necrotic, dead iris, which is stubbornly insistent on socking into the angle in the back of the cornea. And there are other ways to deal with it. You can place iris sutures to try to put the iris under tension to hold it back but in my experience, this doesn't work nearly as well. It's less predictable, and you're less confident over time that these anterior synechia are not going to reform. In my experience, these eyes with horrific problems with necrotic iris in ineluctably shallow chambers, you've got to remove that stuff from the front of the eye. And that's not just the iris, that's often the lens in the capsular bag. And that is psychologically difficult, actually, to take a patient who's pseudophagic with an intact capsule and an IOL in the capsule and remove all of that and do a scleral fixated lens. But in the patients in whom we have done this uh, to, they have maintained low pressures with a minimum of inflammation and clear healthy corneas for a long time after the surgery, after nothing else would do. So this is a little bit of a scary operation, but for our patients who have these problems, I think this has been the key thing which has helped them keep their eye.